do that. Uh, snapshot, a ref snapshotted app, and this is the um, snapshotted application that we're a worker worker for fuzzing, and this is a worker for fuzzing a snapshotted application. Beautiful. Um, that also takes an A. Technically, we don't need the lifetimes to be that cons that tight, but um, I think this is acceptable. So this will be this will take a self, and we'll return a worker with the snapshot, which takes a self reference, and then VM we throw in the trash. But this should work. Uh, pull in VM from VTX. Beautiful. So this is uh, create a new worker for this uh, snapshot. And then this will return a VM. So we'll make a new virtual machine. Doesn't need to be mute. Then down here, uh, this will have the VM. And this is the uh, virtual machine for running the app, application, beautiful. All right, so then we've kind of split up, um, kind of split up the worker as a separate thing. So we basically will create this and then all of them will worker and this will be mute because they'll have mutable access to this now. This will be snapshot dot worker. So this is uh, create a new worker for the snapshot. So now all the threads will create new workers and they'll make their VMs, set those VMs up to an initial states. And now what we can do is um, all this stuff can go away. I'm just going to start deleting stuff as I'm kind of done with things. Coverage and stuff will end up we'll end up redoing that in a different way. Uh, print messages we'll figure those out as well. Okay, we want to set up the guest register state. So we'll impl a for worker a and pub fn um, fuzz. All right, this is like run fuzz case. And this will take a mute self, and this will um, execute a single fuzz case until completion. Right? So we'll start off with self dot um, vm dot guest regs is equal to self dot snapshot dot um, snapshot info dot regs. Right? So. Uh, load the original uh, snapshot registers. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, 371. Unexpected close. Interesting. Even though that's configured off, it still needs to... the the brackets still need to match up. That makes sense because it needs to know what scope to apply config to. That makes sense. Okay. That'll run a single fuzz case. Here, this is to, this is to restore memory. Now, we don't have a great way of doing this yet. And this will be on snapshot self dot snapshot snapshot info dot memory um mm let's pull in mm uh use create mm vm 262 self dot vm and we'll do this i'd like that a little bit more Okay, memory, get unchecked. Oh, that's not memory, that is the, 
That is the translation table, which we previously called memory, relatively incorrectly. Vert to offset. Yeah, verts to offset is what it's called now. Oh, it just barely fits in one line. Okay, so memory is actually found at self.snapshot.memory. Okay. Cannot borrow a page table as mutable because it's also borrowed somewhere else. Oh, because this self. Um, we can probably do this explicitly by doing uh, memory is equal to ref self.snapshot.memory. We probably don't have to ref that. I don't think we have to. Oh, I think we do have to. Let's try it. It's yellow. Um, Oh, it's all these things. I think we're going to have to, outside, we're going to have to move them all here. Um, vert to offset is equal to this. We're just convincing Rust that these are independent ax uh, borrows. And we just have to ref these, and I think we're fine here. But we're just convincing Rust that those are separate which we have successfully done now. What is your current workstation setup? My, well, I have a bunch of different workstations, but my, my true workstation, which is not this computer, is, uh, uh, what is it? It's, I've got six monitors and uh, an eight core, f five gigahertz turbo Intel processor, two tera of NVMe and 64 gigs of RAM. This machine is 64 gigs of RAM, six core turbo to 4.8, and shitty hard drives. This one has three monitors, all, all different shape. i9-9900KS, I think so. Yeah, six monitors, man. Six monitors are where it's at. I love it. I hate working on a single monitor. It's it's just not super productive, in my opinion. Um, I love being able to have basically my whole code base always on display. Because uh, in a given day, I can normally fit everything that I'll ever touch or write uh, kind of up on the screen. So I can just glance at them. Why so many workstations, though? One, I have, a, I have an offline network where I do all my research. So this is technically my gaming computer. This is really the only computer I have that's actually connected to the internet. <laughs> Pretty much everything else I have here is offline. Is that enough screen real estate to see all your cores in HTOP? Mm, just barely. Just barely. That's why we gotta get a, get a new server this week. So let's see what we can do there. Um, so that's looking good, to be honest. That looks great. Let's go, that's copying that. That's resetting the memory. Okay, I was kind of not expecting that to just work. Why was I expecting that to be harder? I don't know. I don't know. But I was wrong. And I, and I should feel bad. Is that Rust I see? Yeah, hell yeah. Why offline? Uh, I do a lot of stuff that I consider sensitive and customers consider sensitive. I also prefer working offline. I think it's just a better experience. I hate the internet. I think the internet's super slow. I hate, I hate when I actually have to download things from the internet. I hate the latency of everything on the internet. I hate how slow things become because everything has DNS requests that go to the internet and then block things and like slow down your computer. Working offline is fantastic. It's like basically when, when you see me doing all these performance tweaks and enhancements and stuff, on an offline network, they're amplified even more with the fact that the network is just completely silent. There's nothing calling out to stupid servers. I mean, they're trying to, but they don't reach out to anything. 
But it's, I, I like that quite a bit. I think it's just a better environment to work on. I have literally 0.1 millisecond latency to my Ubuntu repo, which is super nice. So like, installing Ubuntu literally takes like three minutes from a net install. And that's basically all just partitioning costs. Okay. There we have the single step stuff on. So we're gonna say, I don't think we really need that threshold. So this is going to be, um, uh, counter of number of single steps we should perform. And then this is, um, if single stepping is requested, uh, check if single stepping is, check if single stepping is requested. And then this is going to be enable single stepping. And this is decrement number of single steps requested. And then this is going to be uh, disable single stepping. Then we'll set the preemption timer to this. Now we're actually gonna throw an RNG into here just for funsies. We'll throw a seed into here. This is a random number generator seed. We'll put this in a cell so we can have immutable access to the RNG function, which will hopefully relax some lifetimes. Um, yeah, I think we'll actually just put an RNG in here. And I've written this function, this structure so many times. Pubstruct RNG, uh, the seed is just a cell, U64, we'll pull in cell at the top. So we'll grab use core cell, cell, search for cell, okay. Uh, a random number generator based off of Azure Shift 64, impl rng, fn, pub fn rand, takes self, let's orig is equal, uh, let's seed is equal to self.0.get, make that mute, uh, seed, zor equals seed shift. 13, 1743, 1743. Now we have seed. And I want to actually save the original seed as well. So we'll do uh, let bridge seed is equal to seed. Mm, is equal to self.0.get. And then we'll do this way. Let mute seed is equal to bridge seed. And then we'll return the original seed. We'll have pub fn new. This will create a new RNG, which is a cell new CPU RDTSC. We'll use the timestamp counter to seed that. And then we'll, I don't know, we'll like, um, we'll take the core ID shift by 32 and or that in there. So just in case we have two cores that get the same RDTSC, uh, they'll be slightly different based on that. And then for this in zero to a thousand, we're just gonna shuffle in that RNG and get it nice and nice and randomized since the TSC is not super random. And then we just return the RNG and this returns itself. Uh, creates a new randomly seeded uh, uh, RNG. And this is uh, U-size. I like having a U-size instead because I can use these for slice indices when I'm fuzzing without having to cast. So this is a uh, random uh, get the next random number from the random number generator. All right, that's ballpark what we want. Let's comment this out. If he's streaming this in Twitch, imagine the stuff he's working offline. Yeah, offline's where I do my do my more uh, exotic work. That's for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, take that RDTFC, RNG, get that, 137843, 408, yeah, why, what, 
Which one did I not close? Somewhere. Somewhere I broke something. I guess we'll comment out this whole thing now. Because this might be, like, broken at this stage. Because we, we just ripped some more stuff out of it. Okay, sweet. Perfect. Uh, 252, core ID is a U32. Or a U64. We'll convert this to a U64 prior to the shift. Uh, and I think we have to paren that. Yes, we do. Oh, gross. Lots of parens. And honestly, we'll put the core ID up to like bit 48. We'll put it way up there. Seed, 147. Seed is RNG new. And this is the RNG. It's not a seed anymore. RNG. So we'll create a new random number generator. Oop, R and D. Research in development. 266, this is the original seed. So get the original seed, then we shift that all, and then we want to set that. We want to write that out. Self.0.set seed. So this is going to actually, I'll just format it like this. So get the original seed, perform the operations on it, and then set that back. And then the original seed is what we actually return. That reduces the dependencies on these operations. So these can happen in parallel on the processor. Makes it just a little bit faster of an RNG, which is cool. Um, okay, now we have fuzz case. And now, instead of this, uh, this is self.vm.run, and this will now be, the preemption timer will be self.rng.rand. Yeah. Um, okay, this. Do, do, do. Um, VM three twenty two self dot VM dot guest regs self dot VM dot guest regs. I might just make a self dot regs accessor pretty soon here. Ooh, oh, as u thirty two. It might not like that self when self is barred. Okay, Rust is fine with that. RNG doesn't need to be mute. Where do I do that? Oh yeah. Does not need to be mute. That now makes that a one-liner, which is nice. Okay. Worker doesn't need to be mutable. We're not using worker yet. VM exit we don't use yet. All right. So we reset. Uh, here we'll say reset memory to its original state. And then this is uh, copy the original page into the modified copy of the page. All right. Number of single steps we should perform. If it's greater than zero, set single stepping. Decrement. Otherwise, disable single stepping unconditionally. Set the preemption timer. That's for, uh, set the preemption timer for, oh, and we want to do something like that. Uh, set the preemption timer for randomly breaking into the VM to record coverage information. And this is run the VM until a VM exits. Nice. Now we do a match VM exit, and we'll just do this panic unhandled VM exit. And then we'll, we'll print that information. So right now, everything's unhandled, which is great. And we'll do x at. I'm going to try and start using that syntax more frequently. OK, we're not using VM loop yet. Now it's just worker. Single step we're not using. Yep, and then that's fine. And then worker, we're just going to loop worker dot 
uh, run fuzz case. I'll do a single fuzz case. And this should now work. We're not going to see anything print. But it should work. Okay. Uh, actually, oh yeah, we'll get uh, panics due to unhandled VM exit. Yeah. Perfect. And that's when they start to run. That's the first execution. And they should panic like right away. Yep. So right away they panic because they don't have memory mapped. So now we need to implement the copy on write stuff that we do for the memory, but we actually want to do that in a generic way such that we can invoke the paging in of the memory from a translation routine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to implement something called translate, which I was maybe going to do here, but we're actually going to do it here. Pub fn translate mute self um, and this is going to return a physical address of the page underlying yeah uh, vert adder uh, right. And this is going to translate a translate a virtual address for the guest virtual machine, or for the uh, yeah, translate a virtual address for the guest into a physical address on the host. This only, this will, if write is set, the translation will occur for a write access and thus the, and we'll make this unsafe, and thus the copy on write will be performed on the page if needed to satisfy the right. So now all the logic that we do, whenever we want to access something in the VM's memory, we will call translate, which will then page that stuff in. Um, it'll page it all in, in the same way that we do here, uh, that we moved up here. So we'll yoink all this code. And then we'll probably refactor this a bit because it's a little bit, little bit jank. Okay, this, this dot. Oh, and we'll have an option. We'll have a return an option. Um, if the virtual address is not valid for the guest, this will return none. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we will page align the address Good, and I'm going to remove this code now, this translate, because that's dead. All of this, I think, is basically gone. There's a couple things we want to steal out of there. Um, yeah, now we're starting to get to the meat. Now we're starting to get to the meat. Do I have all the imports? I do. I want those. That's like close to most of what I want. VM self address. Yeah, it should be pretty good. So we have a virtual address and then this is, um, the translation will only be valid for the page the virtual address resides in. The returned physical address will have the offset from the virtual address applied such that a request for virtual address uh, OX1337 leet, leet would return a physical address ending in 337. So that basically says that this isn't going to just 
tell me what page it's on, it's actually going to uh, copy that um, offset in there. Still going? Hell yeah, Quantum. How you doing? So we're going to page align the virtual address. We're then going to get the offset, uh, set text width 79. Oops. Get the offset into the memory buffer where the virtual address is present. If the virtual address is not valid, we will return none. In this case, I will just do a question mark. And if it fails to get that, we return out. And this has to be pretty resilient. So we're going to implement this in a way that it can work in a hostile environment because we need to be able to use this to access memory in the guest that may not be valid. Uh, like We're going to use this to probe addresses in the guest. And if the addresses are, are broken, we want to make sure that we don't end up dying super hard. Fell asleep again, had weird dreams, man. Hope, hope they weren't too weird. Hope they weren't bad. If the page default was inbounds of our mapping, and then, and it was not a write. Um, oh, we don't know it's not mapped yet. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to translate. Yeah. We're going to do this. Uh, get access to physical memory. Then... Translate the page. Uh, oops. Okay. Attempt to translate the page. Um, yeah, we'll say attempt to translate the page. Um, and so we'll pass in the align adder. So this is going to give us the translation. And then we'll say um, it is possible. It has not yet been mapped. And we need to page it in from the network mapped storage in the um, uh, snapshotted app. OK. If. Translation is none. Um, and we might need to promote it as well. Uh, this is page was not mapped. Check if. Oh, yeah, if it's not in this, we just return an error right away. So we actually know at this point, we know that it's inbounds and we actually have that memory offset so page was not mapped and then here we're going to check if um page is not mapped and at this stage since it's not mapped we need to map it in as writable or readable depending on the state so we'll say if write else uh page needs to be cowed from the network mapped file. We, we know that it needs to be cowed at the stage. So we will do a look up the backing. So if it's not a right, then, uh, and where's that read? Does that read volatile? Here we go. I need this. All right. Touch the mapping to make sure it is download, downloaded and mapped. And that memory can be found at, um, I guess that's not at info. This is at self dot. Snapshot dot snapshot info. Yeah, it's the it's this whole thing. We'll just do these. Um and this is uh get access to the snapshot memory and 
information. Okay, then here, this is going to look it up in the vert to offset. Get that from the aligned address. Translate this. So if that doesn't exist, it's not in the snapshot. So bye-bye. Otherwise, at this stage, we're going to translate that. If it was not mapped, then um, let's see, page is only being accessed for read. Alias the virtual, uh, vir alias the guests, guests virtual memory, alias the guest virtual memory directly into the network mapped uh, file page, network map page uh, as read only. Right, so we're going to touch the uh, touch the mapping to make sure that it is downloaded and mapped. So we'll just read one byte at that location, and then we're going to look up the physical page for this mapping. So get access to the host page table. Translate the virtual address into a physical address, and. We know that that has to succeed. Um, this will always succeed as we uh, touched the memory above. So we look up at that memory, turn that into a pointer for that offset. And we translate that, then we get the page, we flatten that, and then we get the actual page, the physical address. So this gives the physical address of the page. And then, this will map in the page as read only into the guest memory, uh, guest page table. So this will write to, this is the aligned address, right? Align adder as page 4K. Ooh, that fits. Nice, nice. Mapping the page is read only into the guest page table. Nice. And then this will be the page uh, fizz adder for the page. So then we can return the page, uh, return the page of the, return the physical address of the backing page. And then this will be on the else side of this, semicolon here. This will be if let sum um, I don't know what I want this to be yet. Translation. Okay. So in this case, it's only being accessed for read alias the guest virtual memory, touch the memory, then we get access to the host page table, we translate that, we do it in a scope so we have that lock for the shortest amount, uh, shortest amount of time possible. We then translate the physical memory of the, yeah, we get the page that backs the memory Okay, and then we map that in read only, and then we're good. So next we wanna implement the other case, and this is page needs to be cowed from the network mapped file. Um, so this needs to be copied. We need to copy on write. We know that the page is not mapped at all. And thus, if the page is not mapped at all, we will do this logic. So we're going to allocate a page. 
Uh, just only this needs to be tabbed in. Allocate a page and zero it out. Well, we're going to initialize the whole thing. So allocate a new page. Alloc fizz. Allocate a new page. Get mutable access to the underlying page. And let's make sure we don't shadow page again. Um, allocate physical memory. Get mutable access to that. Copy in the bytes to initialize the page. And that's from the offset. Uh, from the network mapped memory. Okay, then next we map in the page. Perfect. And this is the align adder. An offset. What is offset? We don't have offset. Do we use it down here? We do. Um, that's just offset. Yeah, that's on the align address. So nowhere should be using virtual address. Perfect. OK, so copying those bytes, map in the page and as read write. And eventually, we'll actually check the permissions of the underlying snapshot such that we can preserve those. So map in the page is read write. And then all this shit basically will go away. Uh, we want this. I want that line. This is what I want. If the mapping exists, is equal to translation. So at this stage, mapping uh, page is mapped. It is possible it needs to be promoted to writable. And in that case, we're going to do this. And we're going to make a copy of the page and do all that shit. So needs to be promoted to writable. And we'll say if write, then we'll just do this unconditionally right now, because that's the only way that we can get a fault at this stage. So then all of this code can go away. Um. Do I have some broken curlies? I don't think so. Offset expected U size found. What's this? Um, okay, so get access to that. That's the that's the old page. Oh, a lot of these got to change. Uh, fizz adder. We got to get fizz adder. We got to get the layout from use core alloc layout. Um, 2D5. Self VM page table. Oh. That's on that page table. This is on self VM page table. We'll see how this stuff formats and behaves. Ooh. Um, 295. Yep, this code's not done yet. Okay. Oh yeah, and this can just this can literally just be the return value. Return the physical address of the backing page. Return the physical address of the new page. That's the new page that we allocated. Uh, offset. What's going on? Three on three. 
offset, expected ref U size, found U size. That was a really weird error, but I understand it. And then expected implicit returns that. Okay. So we have both of these paths return a value, and this one does not. This is, if we say none here, this should now build. Uh, oh, semicolon. Well, we got to do some more work on this page. Page is equal to this. And here we can return none. This will actually be the physical address of the page. And then for this, we will return fizz adder page.0 plus virtual address and FFF. Uh, return the uh, physical address of the requested virtual address. And that's sum. And now we want a semicolon. Oh, that builds. Nice. So we take the bottom bits of the virtual address. We add that to the page. The page comes from the physical address here or the physical address here. OK. If page was mapped, it's possible it needs to be promoted to writable. In this case, if it's right, if this is a write, um, Otherwise, if it's a write and the that's going to have the page, so and the PTE, which is a physical address, mm read fizz PTE as a U64. And page right is zero. Um, check if we're requesting a write and the page is not currently marked writable. Now, sometimes I might want to actually write without setting that, I think. Oh, yeah, and we're also going to have to update dirty bits, potentially. Yeah, definitely. OK. Yeah, there's, there's a decent amount of stuff we still have to do, but we're getting pretty close. So this is allocate a new page. Initialize it and then uh, promote the page from the old readable to writable. Uh, Print page via copy on write. And that's the new page address. And I think we'll format like this today. OK, now this will take the page otherwise we will have a um, we need this case urge page original page dot zero. And that's it. So pre -line, page line the address, get the offset um, into the memory buffer, get access to physical memory. We translate the aligned address using the page table. If we successfully translated, then check if we want to do a, do a write. And what we want to write to is currently not writable. If that is the case, then we Allocate a new page. We got mutable access to that page that we just created. 
we copy the original memory contents into there, and then we write this out as the new page table entry uh, for that page. Otherwise, and we might need to invul pig here. I don't think so. Let me check TLB here. Um, if enable VPID is zero, the logical processor invalidates mappings and combined mappings associated with VPID zero for all PCIDs. Um, what are we in? Is this on a VM entry? Yeah, this is VM entry. So on a VM entry, if that bit is zero, it'll invalidate the linear mappings. Not required uh, for any guess physical. Linear or combined mappings, okay. So we should be fine. Until we enable that, we don't have to worry about that yet. Promote the page via cow, and this is uh, return the original mapped page. And then otherwise, the page was not mapped. If it was right, it needs to be copy on righted from the original file. We do that same logic. Return the physical address of the new page. And in this case, it's access for read, in which case we will touch it. We will look up the physical page backing for the mapping, translate it, get that physical address, and then we'll map that in to the guest, and then we'll return the physical address at the end. And I'm pretty sure this now works. It doesn't allow you to map and unmap pages, but that's acceptable for right now. Um, yeah, are there any other transitions? So map directly to write, that's fine. Read into a write, that's fine. Or read into a read, that's fine, original page. If write and that's not right. And eventually it will just, all of them will just go through here. This is the fast path. The fast path is this, translate, go through here. Okay, so now what we can do is, oh, we need to implement the dirtying stuff. Um, so I think translate's gonna take an argument now. Yeah. Right. And this is gonna be like, whoa, it doesn't take another argument. And we're gonna make it take another argument. Shared sort um um page table source translate this dirty bool um if dirty is set to true then the accessed and dirty bits will be set during the page table walk. So when we translate something for writing, we will then update the dirty bits such that we can reset them. That's what we want to be able to do. So we go through each level. Um, if it is present, Um, if dirty, uh, update dirty bits if requested, right? And then here we can do, uh, unsafe core pointer right volatile to vad as mute u64 and we're going to write the entry or 
page dirty and page accessed typo okay so if dirty was requested then we're going to write volatile to the vad and we'll write the entry that we just read and we'll set the dirty and the access bits on each level there. Okay. Nice. Translate false. False. Oops. What we got? 307 translate false. 426 false. Oh boy. Net mapping. Uh, kernel source net mapping. Net net mapping. 69 false. Okay, and then snapshot at app. We're going to go uh, 357. And that one, we do not want to set those bits. Okay, so this will propagate the access and dirty bits when we write to something through the translation. So that guarantees that they're marked access and dirty throughout the entire table. Sweet. And let's make sure that descends. Um, go through each level in the table. Zero, one, two, three. That's the pointer. And then we read the entry, which is reading the respective one, two, three, four level. One, two, three, four. So yes, this will update the access and dirty bits at all levels. Nice. Nice. Unconditionally. Okay, so now that means we can implement a write and this will allow us to write into the guest virtual memory. So we will have vadder, which is a virtual address in the guest memory, and then a buffer u8. And what we'll do is let patter is equal to self, and this will return an option, number of bytes written, I think. Yeah, we'll do number of bytes written. So this is write the contents of buff into the virtual memory at vadder for the guest. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to translate the virtual address into a pattern. And we'll do while. Um, I guess we'll just make this mute. While well, buff.len is greater than or equal to zero. How's it going, Elphus? Aphelius? Aphelius? JCND, how's it going? Um, translate that. If we fail to translate, then we have a problem. Uh, while the buff.len is greater than zero. Translate the physical address. While, uh, now what we can do is let page remain is equal to buff.len. So this is a number of bytes that remain on the page. Uh, and this will be 
1000 minus patter.0 and FFF. So this is um, computes the remaining number of bytes on this on the page. And I think we'll do if buff.len is zero, return sum zero. Nothing to do in the zero byte case, which case we'll just return zero. Now, in this case, we will we'll translate the physical address. Translate the address, mute buff, and then while buff.len is greater than zero, compute the number of remaining bytes on the page. Okay. And then compute the number of bytes to write. And this will be two writes is equal to, all right, we'll say two copy. I don't want to say write specific things because we're going to have read use this same code pretty much. So we're going to translate the address while there's something to copy. To copy will be equal to um, um, yeah, that's 1000 minus that. So if it were zero, that would be 4K. And then this will be uh, core compare min, the smaller of the two, the number of remaining bytes on the page, and the number of remaining bytes in the buffer. And then we will do a copy. Well, let's, we need to get access to physical memory. Then we will translate get mutable access to the underlying page. And this will be done through to copy. And then PSL copy from slice. So we're going to write into the physical address. We're going to copy from buff to copy and copy the memory from the buffer into it. Okay. And then buff is equal to buff to copy uh, advance the buffer pointer. Uh, buffer pointers, and then we can do physical address dot zero, or physical address is equal to fizz adder patter dot zero plus to copy. Oh yeah, and this will be fizz adder not zero. Okay, uh, starting physical address, and we'll do like not zero and FFF. Oh, we'll just do this. Uh, invalid patter, but page aligned. And then we'll say if the physical address is page aligned, uh, crossed into a new page, uh, translate. So we'll do patter is equal to self.translate the virtual address into uh, for writing okay and then vatter is also going to be mute Vatter is equal to vert adder, vatter dot zero plus two copy. And then at the end, we will return um, Yeah, 
Yeah, we'll just do this. Fuck it. Return sum sum. So it'll return failure if it can't satisfy the entire request. But it might write some things in. Um, returns none if the request cannot be fully satisfied. It is possible that some writing did occur, but is partial. And there's currently no way to indicate what that is. Maybe I want to do that. Um... Somebody once told me. Da, 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 da. Cross into a new page, translate. Then compute the number of bytes left on the page. Then we compute the number of bytes to copy, which is the smaller of the two. The number of bytes remaining in the buffer and the number of the bytes remaining in the page. We then slice up uh, the physical memory with respect to the to copy, and then we copy from the buffer into there, and then we advance the physical address, the virtual address, and the buffer. And to copy um, as you size. Okay, can't add to copy to virtual address. Um, okay. Slice fizz. Uh, on the safe. Soding, holy shit, man, huge raid. PHP! PHP! How's it going? <laughs> PHP in the house! Those emotes are so good, man. I need I need to start making some emotes soon. I'm su super stoked. PHP, you came to the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, this is PHP right here. So what we're doing is we're writing um, Rust, and then we're converting that into PHP using a, a Rust to PHP translator that was written in uh, PowerShell. <laughs> Ooh, unsafe emote? Ooh, that could be good. I'm still waiting on... Twitch hasn't gotten back to me yet on, on Partner. But hopefully, hopefully... We'll become partners. But we'll see. All right, so... Oh, tr translate is unsafe as well. Unsafe. So we're going to translate the buffer. PMEM doesn't need to be mute. Are we using PMEM? Yep. We are. Are we not using it mute here? Wait, where are we not... 264. Why doesn't it need to be mutable here? We don't use it. We don't need it. Okay, I thought we were going to need it, and we didn't need it. <laughs> be mean. So programming in Rust is just placing unsafe everywhere? Yeah, it, you just put unsafe everywhere until, until when you hit compile, you actually get the GCC version number. That's that's when you know you've written the right amount of Rust is when you, when it just defaults to actually using GCC. <laughs> it's like, hey, this is a uh, this is unsafe enough. It's it's time, it's time to switch over to the language that clearly you're trying to use. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna yoink this and paste this, and we're really close to having this implementation done. So the read the contents, read. Read the contents of the uh, virtual memory at Vatter in the guest into the buff provided. And this will be mute. 
<laughs> that, that, the fucking lols, man. <laughs> I love the lols. Lol. Uh, it's possible that some reading did occur, but it's partial. This is called read. This is a... Did we already make that mute? I do not remember making that mute, but I totally did. Ooh, that's scary, because that was, like, literally a second ago then. Um, <laughs> thanks for all the follows, everyone. Gondolin Heritage. Hell yeah. Hope you're having a blast. Hope you guys are enjoying it. So we're working on a um, hypervisor right now. We're actually working on a virtual machine that allows us to... We're, we took a snapshot of WinRAR... So on Windows, we took a memory dump of a running WinRAR unroaring instance, and we're then going to transplant that transplant that snapshot into a virtual machine, and then scale that all out. <laughs> so we're basically going to have a WinRAR instance that, at one point in time, was a valid instance on a real Windows machine, and we transplant it into our VM, and we're going to modify and mutate and inject things into it, and then see if we can get it to crash. And uh, we're just writing the read and write routines to uh, overwrite some of the memory. And I think we're pretty damn close at this stage. This is not copying. This is copying into buff to copy. And it's copying from PSL. Uh, and technically, I don't want to ref that. I think it's just that. Okay. So that's going to copy into the buffer, so this will allow us to read and write memory in the guest. And it will page things in as needed, so let's let's try it. We just implemented these routines. There's a good chance that none of this shit works. So we're gonna say if, if the core ID is not zero, CPU halt, so we're gonna stop execution on all our cores, that will basically make a single threaded uh, and now we're going to do let mute let mute buff is equal to O U eight for ten twenty four. Uh, we'll do like sixty four, and we're going to do worker dot read from vert adder, which we'll need to pull in here. Use uh, page table vert adder. So we're going to read from the virtual address at, where do we have our, oh, we have our windbag right here. So this is actual memory contents. So what we'll do is we will go, we'll just read this. We'll read at EIP, and we'll see if we're able to read uh, mute buff, unwrap, to see if it succeeds. And then here we'll print as hex the buffer. And then we'll halt, just so we don't end up spewing. But this should hopefully print the contents of the memory at this location. Um, I got to as slice that. Yeah, I do. We'll just do this. All right. <laughs> so waffles and strawberries, hell yeah, man. I love that logo. I've been using that for a long time with a lot of my projects. Uh, I just ordered some Indian food. Oh, that sounds so good. <gasps> OF1F44? Brrr. That looks fucking right! That looks right! <laughs> oh! Okay, uh, let's try it when we span a page boundary. So this is like one instance where it might break. Ah, uh, we'll go closer. We'll go to C. And so we'll look at RIP. Um, I guess this address. Disassemble this at FFC or DB. Print the bytes here. And these bytes should line up to what we see here. 38488944243325. Well, I'll be damned. Alright, so I should be able to was that a purr? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> We're gonna write. Vert adder. We're gonna write to this location. And we're going to write uh, OXCC for 4. So we're going to see if we can write into that memory. And that's going to cause a copy on write to occur and create a 
whole new page to get created. And let's put a print in there. Uh, copy on right. And we'll say, um, that's promoting the page. And this is print mapping. Oh, that's on read only. This is mapped as writable. Basically, I'd never want to have a situation where I write to the original page contents. Uh, deadlock detected. Oh, I'm printing inside of a print technically there due to the way that I do that print. I think, I think that was the deadlock. CCCCCC24. Okay, now let's try it spanning the boundary. And we're like, we're, we're basically ready to start fuzzing stuff. Ooh, deadlock detected. Oh yeah, we get that sometimes. I need to figure out what causes that. Is there also a way to confirm that the original page doesn't get corrupted? Uh, I, you, can manu you can manually read the old page. I kind of lose access to that. Um, the biggest thing is... Um, I Yeah, I mean, here we actually check that. So the only place that we return from this function is if these returns. So this returns page for write on a write. And on not write, it can be not write. And then, in this case, it's the original page. If this is a write and it's currently not writable, then we return this out. So this should, that should work. Um, how old are you? I'm 26. <laughs> you haven't slept yet? Hell no. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six. That looks good. I think that works. So now that means all of the complex logic has been moved into translate. And what that means is that when we run the VM and we handle these VM exits, in this case, these page faults, what we're gonna do is uh, up here, we handle a VM exit. Oh yeah, let's, let's start running the VM. So now we can read and write, which is really cool. Bam. So this will have a page fault. And then what we're going to do is on a page fault, uh, if, and I'm going to pull an exception star, I think. Um, use create VTX exception star. I think that'll pull in all the variants of exception. And then we also want uh, VM exit, such that we can do these matches. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to match on if we have a VM exit exception, which is a page fault, we'll get the address from there. And if it's a write, and the rest of the fields we don't care about. So then what we're going to do is uh, continue uh, VM loop. So by default, we will break, at this stage, we'll break out of the loop. Uh, unhandled VM exit break. So at this stage, we will then try to translate. And we'll say if self.translate the address for whatever writing was requested is sum continue VM loop, which indicates that it was handled. And I think that's all we have to do now compared to all the code that we had because we moved it to a different location. Um, oh, this. All right, so, oh, called on safe, no problem. We'll attempt to translate this. It, you know what, does that need to be on safe? No, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't need to be unsafe. A bunch of things in here are going to have to be unsafe now. So I'll have to change a couple of these things. Read volatile, some slicing, some memory. But we will tighten this a little bit. This is unsafe. This is unsafe. Uh, OK. 
Okay. Unsafe here. Unsafe for mapping raw. Unsafe to translate. Unsafe to read volatile. It's like a lot of a lot of the shit's unsafe in here. But the function itself doesn't have to be unsafe. Okay, unnecessary unsafe. Um, what else we got? Should be one more. Oh, two more. Two seventy nine and four forty nine. Oh, yeah, translate is safe. Okay, halt, unreachable. Vert adder, unused in main. Okay. Is it just that halt? I think there are more warnings and errors, weren't there? Unreachable in 112. Fair. Okay, no warnings, no errors. And things should get paged in now as they're accessed. A preemption timer. Sweet. So, this is how we gather coverage. Sorry, but I'm uh, not watching from the beginning. Are you going to fuzz uh, source close Windows PE files with coverage with your chocolate milk? Will be ultra fast to do that? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. We'll be able to do this. Uh, we'll be able to fuzz anything in this. Right now, we can only fuzz applications. We haven't written the actual hypervisor for, um, we haven't written a hypervisor that can run a whole OS yet. That's, it's just a little bit more work than we've done so far. So we're just kind of taking a stepping point and running applications in this environment. And that's where we're at. Um, so we're just about to start fuzzing WinRAR. We're going to be fuzzing it in probably about 15 minutes. So we'll be seeing what those performance numbers will look like. We'll be seeing coverage information and all of that stuff. So we're just about to implement coverage support right now. So we're going to say on a VM exit, preemption timer. This is going to track the coverage database. And coverage will be in snapshot information. This will be coverage. This will be a lock cell of a uh, hash set. A B tree set. Um, yeah, I really want to use atomic hash table, but I can't quite use it yet. Uh, B tree set. And this will just have U64s. So B tree set. And this will be lock interrupts. Um, and this is. Uh, Coverage database containing all observed PC or RIP values. Okay, we don't have lock interrupts and we don't have lock cells. So let's grab those. Use lock cell, lock cell, and then use crates core locals, lock interrupts. Okay. 262, yep. And what happened here? Is that Vim getting confused? It is Vim getting confused. 142 coverage. This is gonna be a B tree set new. Locks all new on that. So create a new locked variable. Sweet, now down here, oh, that all can go away. So there's our translate, all that fun stuff. And we don't need translate to be pub. And Vim's getting really confused. All right, on a preemption timer, that's going to be a coverage event. So we'll say, first of all, we're gonna continue the VM loop whenever we get a preemption timer, regardless. And then we're going to look up the current PC value and insert it into the coverage table. And if we got new coverage, then I'll set single step to a, a higher value again. So I'll say if 
self dot snapshot dot coverage dot lock dot insert um self dot vm dot uh guest regs dot rip kind of gross but if that was the first time we inserted it then single step becomes 1000 and this is uh new coverage was hit what data structure did you use this is just a b tree set for testing but i actually have a specialized table that i call an atomic hash table because it's an atomic hash table it's a hash table without locks uh, it only supports insertion but it allows you to just insert coverage events and you never you never delete coverage thus i don't actually care uh in that situation so no field coverage oh i put it totally on the wrong spot coverage should go here Okay, luckily that was not that big of a deal. 30 or 44 clone not implemented for Ooh. Okay. So I will just arc this whole thing then. So snap doesn't live long enough and this will return, I guess we'll just arc this thing. And that works fine here. So we'll wrap the whole thing in an arc. I'm okay with that. Okay. And we gotta pull an arc. So we'll grab uh, use alloc sync arc. You can hear the MX Blues. Oh, yeah. They're delicious, man. Oh, shit. I was kind of not expecting that to work, but it did. Hey, debug exception. That's because we put it into single stepping mode because we want coverage. So every time we observe new coverage, we set single stepping for a certain amount of time. So basically, we hit new coverage. We then tell it to single step for a while. And that allows it to uh, ca capture coverage that's nearby. And basically the logic there is that it's likely that coverage is next to, uh, like nearby each other. So I'll say coverage.lock and we'll set single step. Okay, external interrupt. For that, we're just going to ignore it. VM exit external interrupt. That's when a host interrupt comes through. We'll just say continue the VM loop. Um, host interrupt happened. Ignore it. Is MX reds? What are MX reds? What what's their like? What's their trait? What's their specialty? Invalid opcode. Ah, that's a syscall. There we go. Exception, invalid opcode. This is stochastic though. There could be coverage you don't observe because your preemption wasn't quick enough. Yes, absolutely. So, but I deem that as not a big problem. I'm not too concerned about getting every piece of coverage because coverage is not coverage is not the be all end all of fuzzing. Um, it'll converge to correct very quickly. Like this will be close to perfect within about 10 seconds. Mush, no feedback, but I love them. Interesting. You'd be the expert. I mean, I still need to test it, right? Like theoretically, maybe it is really bad, but like we can think of theoretical situations where missing one thing of coverage Maybe it's a one in a million chance that you observe that coverage event and you just don't capture it and then you don't save that input off. But it's just so unlikely. Um, it's, it's just kind of rare. But that being said, this is, a, um, this is mainly a coverage mechanism as a just a testing 
starting point. Um, okay, so we will print. Uh, we assume invalid opcodes are. Um, we assume invalid opcodes are syscalls. Syscall is equal to self dot vm dot regs dot racks, and we'll match the syscall number, and we'll say x at this panic unhandled. Uh, if it's an unhandled syscall, we'll just print unhandled syscall, and we'll print it as hex syscall. Speaking of keyboards, I got two of the code keyboards. One for home, one for one for work. What is the, what's the style of those? Are they, um, are they a full keyboard, a uh, half keyboard, numpad, no numpad? All right. See, so we got unhandled is called seven. So historically, I think seven. Sys call seven. Um, this is whatever it is. We're we're just returning an invalid parameter. Um, but we probably should have a comment for this. Uh, self dot vm dot guest regs dot racks is equal to this. Uh, continue vm loop. Um, seven 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 seven. Ox oh seven. This is NT device out control file. Return status. I think it's status under invalid under parameter. Yeah, we'll yoink it. Paste. All right. So we're faking out that syscall because we're executing and we hit that syscall. Oh, and I should probably do this. Unhandled syscall D. Oh, yep, 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 yep. Self.vm dot guest regs dot rip plus equals two. We want to advance past the syscall instruction. Okay. See guys freezing up. Okay, reset. There we go. Now we have 1A7. This is mine. Oh shit. Huh. How do you how do you like that? I cross a I, I cross my hands across what would be that boundary very frequently because I don't type using the normal uh, typing positions for my hands. So I can't use any of the split keyboards at all. Uh one A seven. And one A seven, what was this? Oops. Uh 1A7, set thread execution state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then this gets to the NT write file, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, eight. Eight is NT write file, and that's what we consider the end of the fuzz case, in this case. Um, this is an NT write file, end of fuzz case, and break VM loop. So if we see an NT write file, we will consider that the end of the fuzz case. So at this point, we will now, ignoring that deadlock, this should now be fuzzing. Oh, we don't print any status. We don't record any stats. So let's have uh, fuzz cases. This will be an atomic U64 uh, number of fuzz cases performed on the target. And then we'll pull in use core sync atomic, atomic U64 and ordering. And then at the end of the fuzz case, which is here, uh, VM loop. We will do self dot snapshot dot fuzz cases dot fetch add one ordering sequentially consistent. And this is 
update number of fuzz cases. 144. Uh, fuzz cases is an atomic U64 new initialized to zero. So now we can track the number of fuzz cases that we're performing. And then we'll have one of the cores over here print some statistics. Or do I want statistics done on behalf of every... Uh, we'll, we'll print the stats on our side for now. Um... Ever thought about fuzzing virtual devices and hypervisors? Uh, I've done a little bit of that. Uh, I have a I have a whole toolkit that's designed for fuzzing uh, virtual machines. Um, let's take a look here. Uh, get that snapshot. Halt. Okay. Then we just fuzz in a loop, and then I'll have. Let next print is equal to CPU or time future one second in the future if CPU RDTSC exceeds the next print threshold. We're going to print some statistics. And this is only on core zero. Then next print will be equal to time future one million print fuzz cases 10 uh, let's fuzz cases is equal to um hmm I'll do this pub on this Fuzz cases is equal to snapshot dot load uh, fuzz cases dot load ordering sequentially consistent. And then this will be uh, let IT CPU RDTSC. So we save save the current time and compute a time in the future to print status messages. So we're going to say if. We have exceeded that time. We're going to print the number of fuzz cases. We're going to print the uh, fuzz cases per second. Probably four is fine here. Maybe three fuzz cases per second. And then coverage is this. And we will do um, fuzz cases. Fuzz cases as F64 divided by time elapsed since the initial time and then coverage will be fuzz cases dot coverage dot lock dot len and it's not fuzz cases this is um snapshot uh let coverage is equal to snapshot dot coverage dot lock dot len okay i just want to keep those lock durations as low as possible Okay, ordering we didn't pull in yet. Uh, use core sync atomic ordering. Hell yeah, and I think we're here. This isn't fuzzing anything yet, but we are at parity at what we had before. And there we go, we have our fuzz cases, we have our coverage increasing. Um, we'll set coverage to a six. And I'm gonna restylize this a bit, cases. Type this fuzz cases per second. Okay. So this just will have a slightly different format. Nice. And then we can get rid of this halt and run it on all cores. And then we'll run this on bare metal hardware here. There we go. So this is on bare metal. Uh, 35,000 fuzz cases per second, uh, which is pretty good. Of course, you're always putting in that work. Hell yeah, it is. Had to relearn touch typing, but overall way more comfortable to have uh, split for your wrists. Linear layout feels uh, more natural. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I've noticed that those keyboards are getting more and more popular, and I can't really doubt why they're getting popular, so... 
I would hazard they're they're probably they are probably better. Um Okay. I'm not a tech guy. What exactly is the purpose of the program that you're making? So basically we use this to find bugs in software. So we use this so we can quickly run software. So in this case, here this is actually a perfect example. If you're familiar with the application WinRAR, it's an application that's used on Windows to extract RAR files and a bunch of different other uh, files. Um, it's similar to 7-Zip. If you've never heard of WinRAR, it's similar to 7-Zip. And if you've never heard of 7-Zip, then it's similar to the unzipping on Windows. Whatever it is, it, it unpacks files. And what we've done is we took a snapshot of that application. So basically all of the memory and register states and everything about that application, we took a snapshot of that. And then we transplanted that into our own virtual machines. And what we're able to do is we're able to cause it to attempt to decompress a file, in this case, 34,000 times per second. So typically, if you're fuzzing something like WinRAR, it's very difficult to get many fuzz cases a second because it's closed source. You can't rebuild it to have a hot loop. You're kind of forced into that environment. So what we're able to do is by moving that out and doing what I call snapshot fuzzing, we're able to take a snapshot right after the file read occurs. We can mutate the bytes in place, and then we can see what effect that has on the input file uh, or the, the program, and we can see if that causes the program to end up crashing. So that is our goal. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to try to actually corrupt this. So we know, um, we know that the buffer, since we saved this information, uh, CDBZ pre read. Um, I think the buffer is. This is the buffer. So this is the address of the buffer that we're going to write. Um, const buffer is equal. Uh, buffer adder is equal to this. Uh, we'll say vert adder. Um, okay. Uh, buffer for the uh, file contents in WinRAR. And then we can const buffer size is a fixed OX. Uh, oops. Uh, this is a U size, and it's OX2123, and that is this size right here. And I'm pretty sure that's how many bytes actually got returned, so we can check on the other side. We can check the return value from read file, which goes into the IO status block, which we actually need to check where that was. Um, Pre-read, and the IO status block for read file is... Uh, into your read file. Um, okay, it's right before the buffer is the IO status block. So this is the IO status block. Okay. So then after it's done reading, we can see that it read successfully 2123. So we know exactly how many bytes it read from the input file. How do you mutate your test cases? I suppose it's just bit flipping. Uh, does new coverage path impact the next, genera next generated test cases? Not yet, but we will add that in about 15 minutes. So we're gonna make this a coverage guided fuzzer, which means that the coverage events will cause us to build up a database of inputs that we'll use. And coverage guided fuzzing is actually very simple to set up. Um, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start off by flipping some bytes. We know, and I'm gonna make a note of this locally, we know that the maximum coverage we've ever seen is three four or three three four seven, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, let's see, doop doop doop, trying to find a notepad. All right, here we go. So I'm going to make note of that, and we're going to see if our corruption has an effect on the amount of coverage we get. Uh, so this we're going to say three three four 
seven. And that is the total amount of coverage that we have. So what we're gonna do is we're going to randomly corrupt that input. So we're gonna read that input out. Um, so we'll do, before we do a fuzz case, so we'll uh, corrupt the, in, the input. And we'll do this by um, uh, worker.rand. And we'll go for this many bytes in this to this mod up to 64 bytes of corruption. Offset is equal to worker.rand mod buffer size. And then we will write to that location. So we'll do a snapshot dot write to the virtual address at the buffer address plus the offset as a U64, and we will write in a single byte, which will be a worker.rand as U8. And then we'll unwrap. We'll make sure that we actually were able to perform the write. Um, it'd be probably better if we read the whole thing out and write the whole thing in bulk, uh, but whatever. Oh, worker.rand. We gotta do worker.rng. Uh, we'll make that pub. Okay, worker.rng.rand. And we'll probably change this API and make this a little bit cleaner, but whatever. Uh, write. Oh, it's not snapshot. This is on worker. So for this worker, we're going to write at this random offset inside of the buffer, and we're going to write in a random value. Use core, uh, use page table vert adder. Okay, so this is now doing corruption, and we'll see if we get anything different than 3347 coverage. This is very light corruption right now. And we'll see. It seems like one of the cores is stuck. Come on. I've noticed that sometimes this gets stuck. I need to figure out the soft reboot case here. It's just a really hard problem. Um, no luck here. No luck here. M might have to reboot that. Not that big of a deal. Reset. All right, so let's see if we get more coverage. Before we had 3347, 3344. Now this is decompression. So decompression often won't really have much that you can gain. Um, it's relatively unlikely that we really actually change anything here. And it looks like we haven't. Now, that could either mean our writes don't work, but I don't think that's the case, or it means there's just really nothing to mutate here about that decompression. Yeah. There's 3347. But at this stage, I'm guessing this is actually the raw payload. It's already parsed out the header. So there's really probably nothing that we can do with this snapshot. Um, there's just nothing that we can really gain here. Um, okay, so, got that local panic, so this is on hardware, 34,000 a second, that's pretty good, and how much are we losing on that coverage, because I think we're doing FFF for our mask, this preemption timer, let's go to FFFF. So a 16x decrease in the amount that we're doing our preemptions. And let's see if this makes a bigger difference. I don't know why that 
get stuck so often. I don't know what this is deadlocking on. Cle clearly it's getting stuck on some lock. I don't know if it's prints. I don't know what the other course would have a lock to that I used during the soft reboot stage, but there's something that... Or I'm waiting for those cores. No. I could be waiting for the cores to come offline and they're not responding to the NMIs. So, unfortunately, it's a fucking hard problem. So I guess we're just going to have to... It's definitely a, a thread-related thing. Um, okay, so we'll see how much this affects the fuzz cases per second. Uh, quite a bit. And coverage doesn't really seem hurt by that too much. So we might just need a better target to fuzz. But... Uh, effectively, we have a fuzzer here, and until we have something that coverage actually matters on, uh, we're not going to be able to really demonstrate uh, code coverage and feedback. So... And let's move from Sausage Factory into here. Well, we need to, we need to clean up that project before we do that. Okay, how fast does this run? It should be like 55 or 60,000 a second. Okay, ignore that. Okay, it's still 35,000 a second. Huh, so we're really just not losing much on these preemption timers. So the preemption timers cost a lot more in... That would make sense. The VM exits are more expensive. So preemption timers are more expensive in the nested vert. On hardware, it just it doesn't really matter that that performance. Okay. Um, I'm gonna hit the head. I'm gonna think of some things to fuzz maybe. All right. Uh, I don't know how to program. I work in construction, and I feel like a caveman watching. I think I just think it's so cool uh, what you're doing, even even though I don't uh, understand anything of it. Well, I'm glad you enjoy it. Um, actually, interesting story. I always wanted to be in construction growing up. The when I was a kid, kind of the the different jobs that I wanted. Um, here. We'll just, we'll just talk with chat. I actually have to refill some items on my character, and we're at a good, like, sinking point. So, when I was a kid, I wanted to... I think the first job I ever wanted to have was to be a garbage man. I, like, I just thought the, the garbage trucks were so fucking cool. Like, you get to drive around this bulletproof tank as a job every day. <laughs> what the fuck, Tibia? Yeah, I, I play Tibia. <laughs> um... But then, slowly as I aged, I, like, when I was, like, probably six plus, I really wanted to do construction, and I would basically watch. All I would do is I would watch videos. My mom would go and get uh, videos from the library 
that would, um, basically, the videos would, uh, show, like, builders building houses, and they were just kind of long-form videos. There was nothing, like, really special or crazy about them. It was just, like, someone set up a camera and pointed it at builders for, I don't know, a couple hours, and I would just watch those. I fucking loved it. Uh, and I remember one of my, one of our family friends was building a deck and they invited me to like help. So I was there with like the building crew and they gave me like, they gave me, I don't know, a fucking, a drill, maybe a hammer. <laughs> and like, I put some screws in the deck and that was one of the coolest days of my life as a kid. Oh my God. <laughs> uh so yeah, I actually really like uh, construction and building. I That is very likely what I would have ended up in if I didn't discover computers. Um, I think it's really neat. Let's go to... Uh, um, <laughs> what this guy is achieving here, it usually takes teams of 30 people working full time for years. I don't know if it's that much. I think I think a lot of people could do this, but there are definitely some like uh, I don't know how to describe it. It it feels like there are almost guidelines that that people kind of push onto people for what is and isn't hard and what is or isn't something that can be done. And I think I uh I have a tendency where I look at what is actually possible and not look at what other people have done. And I think about more what can theoretically be done rather than what someone else has done. Because I think a lot of programmers look at what other people have done and use that ever as a reference point of like what is actually possible with computers. Which is off often they did those things that way because it was the fastest path to money or it was the fastest path to get the product out the door or they were constrained by some other uh, reasons. And I, I think that's a, a big aspect of a lot of the work I do is just uh, focusing on specifically, uh, oops, I don't know why I can talk while programming, but I can't talk while buying runes in Tibia. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, I, th I think a lot of the things are really not too difficult, but they're definitely outside of the box, which means that there are no resources for learning a lot of the stuff that I do. There's really no reference other than directly at the manual and reading through and trying to figure out what how the things work. So, but yeah, I would say something I've done almost my whole life and and y'all will notice it when you watch me stream, is I don't use any third-party code. I don't use libraries, I don't use crates, I don't really pull anything in. Obviously, I'm running on an operating system. Obviously, I'm using compilers. Like, if we want to nitpick, of course I'm using third-party code. But I don't pull it into my own projects. In the case of this kernel, there's literally no foreign code in this kernel, with the exception of, like, the Rust core library, which I'm fine with that. I'll give that a pass. Um... Because it's kind of required. Oops, I'm already in Carlin. We can go to Venor. But yeah. Um, let's see. You're wrong. A lot of people could not do that. I, I, I recognize that. It's something that I, I really don't like coming to terms with. Uh, but I do get stern talking to's every once in a while when I'm like... Maybe I have higher standards for people because I, I guess, I don't know. I just kind of assume that a lot of these things are more feasible. Um, and, and maybe that's, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's a flaw. Maybe I need to recognize my, my talent more. I do recognize I suck at working on teams and a bunch of other things that make other developers much better developers than I am. Uh, but I guess technically I'm, I'm a pretty good developer. Um, okay, so we almost got this all done. Oh, we did have one, we had one backpack of blanks left. Okay. Nice. Uh... 
All right, and then I have to go pick up those runes on my other characters. Um, let's see. Look at that HD water shader. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's definitely um, my GPU is definitely screaming when I'm playing Tavia. It's it's barely keeping up. Now I've been I've been playing this game since I was a, a young kid, for about 15 years now. So and this server came out, I don't know, like six months ago, and of course I had to join the server and try and get top skills because that's something that I, for some reason, really enjoy doing. Even though there's no point because it doesn't actually make you any better. Uh, but it's fun. So. All right, here we go. Um, weird. Okay, and then this character, I think I have a couple more runes left. I have one more, okay. Um, let's see. I got laid off due to Corona. Before you uh, go into the coding, I, uh, if I wanted to do a career change and learn the program, is there a best course you would recommend? I don't know of many. Um, I don't. I don't really know of the good sites to teach programming. I know that there are many out there. I just don't know of them, so I don't really have a great reference point for that. There are a lot of people in here that hopefully could su suggest some uh, to you, King Civil. Uh, Code Academy is great. Okay. Yeah, I have heard great things about Code Academy. Okay, uh, I don't get your point uh, with coverage-guided fuzzing. You have a basic test case. You mutate it. It shows new coverage. How do you mutate this new test case? Uh, or uh, the point is to only use this new test case. So typically, coverage-guided fuzzing, the way I do it, and I do it in a, in a much different way than a lot of people do coverage-guided fuzzing, but what I do is when I get new coverage, we're not doing it in this case, so just a heads up, we're not doing it in this case, but... Um, coverage guided fuzzing to me is when you get a new coverage event, when you recognize that something new happened in the application under test, you save off the input that caused that. And in this case, everything is deterministic. The same input will always yield the same result. And that means that if we save that input off, we can use that input to hit that same, let's say, rare code path again. Now, when I do coverage guided fuzzing, Every time I hit new coverage, I will save off the input that got me there. And since it's deterministic, I can actually go back and mutate that. So typically, I will have this corpus that I'll accumulate, which are all of the different inputs that caused an increase in coverage. And I would use this corpus to, I would basically, before a test case, I would randomly pick an input to use out of the corpus. I would copy it into a local buffer. I would mutate it. I would inject it in as the input. I would let it resume execution, and I would see if that got me more coverage. Now, the goal of coverage-guided fuzzing is basically, um, uh, basically with coverage-guided fuzzing, you're trying to turn um, exponentially hard problems into linearly hard problems. And that's done by, if we, if we do our great GIMP graphics here, um, Basically, let's say you have a program here, and here's the like assembly blocks. So the program makes a decision of if yes, go here, if no, go here. This is basically how computers work. Everything is a yes or no decision. So the program's making all these yes or no decisions to go to all these different locations in the code. Now, let's say this is, this is the program, and it takes your input into here. Right, so that's your input designated I. Designated I. So we're going to come in here, and let's say there is a 1% chance that you hit this path, this path on the left side here. Now, what coverage allows you to do is it might be a 1% chance for you to actually hit this block. However, once you hit it, and once you detect that coverage, typically you have perfect coverage. We have imperfect coverage. But typically when you have perfect coverage, you then save that input off. So you note that you got some new coverage in this block, and you save off the input that caused you to get there. Now, since everything is deterministic, if we were to take this input and feed it back in without changing it, we would know that we would end up going back into this path, which is a rare 1% case. And now that means that we have a 100% chance of hitting this 1% chance. 
right? Because we're, we've guaranteed, we've satisfied these constraints. And now what that means is if we switch that to the other say, side, and let's say the other side is the rare path, let's say this side is the 1% chance, and this side is a 1% chance, which means that this is a, this is a 1 in uh, 10K, 1 in 10,000 chance, right? If I do the math right, I'm pretty sure I did, but this is a 1 in 10,000 chance. Now with code coverage, what you have to do is you have to win this 1 in 100 chance. And when you hit that 1 in 100 chance, you save off this input, I. And now you have this input saved off. Now that means that you can hit this 100% of the time. And let's say that you have another input saved off here. So you have input, let's say this is input 1. This is input number 2. And let's say you pick between these evenly. So you have a uniform distribution of picking between the two inputs that you've observed. So far you've seen hitting this, and you've seen hitting this, and then technically you'll see hitting this as part of one of these, because one of these uh, will pass through. Now this means that you have a 50% chance of hitting this block, which is traditionally a 1% chance. And then this 1% chance, now that you have a 50% chance of this, this is no longer 1 in 10,000. This is now actually 1 in 200. And now that you have a 1 in 200 chance of hitting this, this becomes a lot easier to hit. And especially when we're talking, these, these numbers, this like 1 in 10,000 is a very small number. Typically, these numbers are not 1 in 10,000, 1 in 200. These are 1 in 4 billion. <laughs> these are massive, massive, massive numbers. So effectively, what this allows you to do is it allows you to kind of amplify the progress that you've already made. Um, so yeah, that's effectively code coverage in a nut nutshell. And basically this reduction right here, in this case, where we have a 1%, 1%, and then another branch, so two inputs in the database, it's a complex function, right? It's a relatively complex function to actually compute the benefit you get. But the benefit is basically uh, you flatten, if we simplify it over here, you flatten a problem. And let's say you have uh, four byte compares in a row that must pass, right? This is like the, the glorious chain for a coverage. So this is basically a one in 256 chance. And then that chance is the same for all of them. So you have a one in 256 chance of passing all of these conditions and then that looks like shit. I probably should just select this better. There we go. There we go. Quality. And then a 1 in 256 chance to get to here. And we'll just draw here. Uh, this is the last thing. And if you're not familiar, 256 is the number of different values that you can have. Uh, let's flatten this. I don't know why. Oh, because I have that selected? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so 1 in 256 is the values that you can have in a byte, right? And a byte is kind of like the smallest thing that you typically have on a computer. Now, 1 in 256, if we don't have code coverage and we have to get all of these correct, the chance of getting it correct is 1 over 256 to the fourth power. Right, but uh, which which is equal to one in uh, four billion. Right, this is one in four billion. It's a little bit more than four billion, but one in four billion effectively. So the odds of randomly getting through this is one in four billion. And unless you write fuzzers that run at the performance that mine do, it's likely that four billion is not a feasible number of fuzz cases that you can do. <laughs> I do have tools that let me do that, which is fucking awesome, but a lot of people don't have capabilities that let them reasonably brute force through a one in four billion chance. So instead, when you use coverage, these comparisons are now, you do them one at a time. So it basically turns this equation, this, this uh, one over 256 to the fourth into a one over 256 times four or not times four, uh, divided by four, right? And that number happens to be a lot better than one in four billion. <laughs> that number is one over 1,024. 
So it's a, about a 0.1% chance of getting through here. Now, obviously, these are creating inputs as you diverge off these paths. You have more things in your corpus. So whatever, 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 it's probably at the end of the day, it's like one in, uh, let's say, like 8,192 is, is probably the most likely, right? So that's about like a 0.02% chance, some, some shit like that. Um, which that turns out one in 8,192 is a lot better than one in four billion. And that's why we do code coverage. <laughs> so that's effectively what we do. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, it's like very few people who stream actually write code. I'm tired of seeing these people just staring at the screen. This channel's different though. Glad you enjoy it. Hell yeah. Um, if, if you're looking to learn programming, don't get hung up too much on a language. Learn Python or JavaScript or C or whatever. The more important skills like problem solving and computational thinking transfer pretty well from language to language. That's totally true. Once you learn one language, almost all the others start to become easier and easier and easier and more of the same. Uh, and that's, that's one thing that's kind of important. Um, holy shit, that makes so much sense. I'm glad. Hell yeah, I hope this made some things click for some people who have never actually really looked at the, the mathematics of, of uh, uh, coverage-guided fuzzing. And this is at a high level. This is not actually looking into the, the real behaviors and mechanics. Um, isn't it better achieved with symbolic execution so you get all the constraints? Not really, because typically symbolic execution doesn't work in most realistic environments. Um, yes, symbolic execution is theoretically better, but also symbolic execution is typically infeasibly slow. Uh, typically the state space is too large and it can't handle things like threads. It can't handle things like a, a mutable uh, memory that is written by IO devices. Um, it can't handle uh, basically any modulo or uh, and arithmetic. So anything where you kind of lose, when you have a, a many to one conversion. So of course symbolic is fantastic, right? Symbolic is always best. If you can actually solve the program as a mathematical equation, that's amazing. But it turns out like five branches into almost any real program, the equations just become way too large. And not five branches, it's more like, you know, hundreds of branches. But hundreds of branches is typically tiny. It's like negligible. And that's where you bottleneck, right? Because the equations you end up building are so massive that you just can't feasibly solve them. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into that and symbolic is more used locally where you can use fuzzing to kind of get you nearby things and then use symbolic to try to find roughly around there what you can do with it. Um, but symbolic is typically not effective uh, when you use it as the only uh, technique. So yeah. Um, I use symbolic execution in CTFs and solving virtual machines without fully reversing them. Yeah, it's a great it's a great thing for for those situations because CTF challenges are just the the bugs are always really obvious and they're always really simple programs and they typically don't have much modulo arithmetic just due to the nature of the programs they're typically just purely load store arithmetic. Um, there, there's really no like modulo. There's not much masking going on. There's not much like shifting where you're losing bits. Um, so yeah, and, and CTF pro, uh, problems are actually pretty simple even for fuzzers uh, to get through. So, and that's why I don't like a lot of papers that go into using, you know, honestly, any technique. I don't, I don't think really any technique bears much merit if it works well on CTFs, because CTFs are just not realistic problems in, in most situations. Of course, there are parallels. Of course, there are connections that can be made, uh, but typically CTF challenges are just not uh, representative of, of, of real programs. Um, what exactly is symbolic execution? Okay, we can talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm not an expert on symbolic execution. I've done very little work on symbolic execution. Uh, I haven't really used many of the big tools out there, but I have worked on writing a symbolic execution engine. So I have a little bit of background on it, but not much. Um, let's see. So symbolic execution is basically the, um, 
Symbolic execution is, is basically the idea of turning a program into a mathematical uh, problem, right? So what you'll have is, let's say we have that same situation here where, let's say, um, we have this code flow here, and we'll kind of space these out a bit more, and we'll say this. And let's say you have one input that is A. Uh, actually, you have an a input A and you have an input B. All right, so let's say that this happens. You go down this path. If A is equal to seven, and you go down this path, if A is not equal to seven, we'll make it really easy. If A is not, I was gonna draw a zero. If it's not equal to seven, and then you hit this path instead of this one, and this one will be B is equal to a six is when you hit this path, right? So, and then let's just ignore that this exists, but it, it does technically exist. So the, the concept of symbolic execution is to figure out these constraints. And let's say that this function or this block here adds five to A. And basically symbolic, what symbolic will do is it will actually transform the code into a mathematical expression such that you'll get a formula where it says to get here, a plus five must equal seven. And let's say, so that is the, that is the constraint, right? That is considered the constraint to hit this block. So then you go to a solver and you say, hey solver, can you solve this equation for a? And it will try to find an A in which this is true. And it will find very quickly, because this is simple, it'll find that if you have 2 and you add 5 to it, you get 7. And thus, if you provide a 2 for A, you'll be able to take this path. Now let's say that in this path, you take, um, we're going to take B and we're going to mod it by 15, okay? So this is really easy because this has one solution and it's a really simple uh, equation. Now here, let's say this constraint is now for this block, B modulo, uh, modulo 15 must equal to six and A, plus five must be equal to seven. And so then you send this off to a solver and you say, solve this for me. Well, this part's really easy. It'll just say, um, or not equal to seven. So this will say that A has to be any value in the set of all real numbers, ex excluding the set I don't know the actual mathematical notation, excluding the set containing seven. So basically it can be any number that is not seven, right? Now in this case, this B mod 15, this can be anything uh, in the set where uh, it can be basically modulo, if you're not familiar, this is the remainder. When you do like long division and you get the remainder, that's what the modulo operator is. And at this point, you will get uh, a bunch of different values here where B could be one of many values uh, as well. And it gets harder and harder and harder. Now, when you make these constraints start depending on each other, it starts getting fucking impossible. Yeah, like if you make this B mod A. Now, you have to find a solution where B has a remainder, uh, B, when divided by A, has a remainder which is equal to, oh, and that's B mod A plus five, right? Has a remainder that is equal to, I think six, or whatever we said, right? And it turns out this is really fucking difficult. Now, luckily, there are a lot of solutions to this. And since there are many solutions to this, uh, I think there are many solutions to this, 
um, that makes it a little bit easier because the solver just has to find one solution. It doesn't have to find all solutions. It just has to find one um, before it stops. However, in some situations, there may only be one solution where it's a, a one in two to the 64 chance where there's only one solution to an equation. And unless the mathematics work out that it can actually reduce it to solve it, the solver has to resort to literally brute forcing it and just trying random things until it works. And it turns out that trying random things against the real program when fuzzing, which you can do at thousands or hundreds of thousands of times a second, outperforms solvers when solvers have to brute force things, but they're doing hard math using like big num libraries and crazy set logic where you can do like two attempts per second. There may also be zero solutions. Yes, that's actually a common case. So you have to, you have to be worried about the stalling case, which is it is literally impossible for any path to get through here. And that is basically where all sol solvers start to fail. Um, and that is so many conditions. Because it turns out when you have a function that calls printf with a fixed string, there's a lot of code in printf which no longer can be invoked. And the solver can hopefully prove, based on the parsing of those strings, what can and can't be done in printf. Spousal equivalent to the halting problem? It absolutely is. Solving programs is impossible. It is provably impossible. You, you, can, you cannot solve all programs. You can solve some programs, of course, but you cannot solve all programs. And thus symbolic is not a universally universally applicable technique in its entirety. Obviously, you can extract pieces of it and you can use it locally for certain areas of the code that you have deemed interesting. Um, at my job, we can de-obfuscate uh, old versions of VM protects with symbolic and taint executions. Shit is lit. Yeah, that sounds pretty accurate. Um, <laughs> I know like four of these words. De-obfuscate. You should know deobfuscate, but that's to like figure out what something actually was. And then VM protect is a uh, uh, basically like an encryption scheme. It's not actually encryption, but it's a scheme that is used to obfuscate and kind of hide the inner workings of our program, typically used on things like games to prevent you from being able to reverse out how the games work, which then prevents you from learning how to make cheats and do all these different things. So it's a way of basically obfuscating, which is a, a term for, uh, basically making it very confusing what is actually going on. Uh, so that's what VM Protect is effectively for. And I think VM Protect actually uses some other technologies to, to truly uh, provide some protection to some level, but effectively it's to kind of hide what's going on. Um, you trace the VM state and rebuild the program without all the garbage instructions. Yeah, it works so well. Uh, and you can do that with fuzzing as well, which is interesting. You can just, you can literally just fuzz and then run the trace through const prop. So you can build up the equation of what the program is doing and then const prop it. Um, so when, when you, symbolic, building a symbolic expression is cheap. Like making a mathematical expression of the program is cheap. So as long as everything is concrete, which it is if you run the actual application, you can then reduce the equation which is typically very, very doable. So you can kind of propagate all the things that are have no effect. And typically obfuscation is done by making a lot of things that do nothing by injecting a shit ton of those into the code. So what it does is if you make an equation, so let's say, let's say the, the obfuscation of your code is that it takes A and then it adds five and then it subtracts five, right? That's the obfuscation. Obviously, it's not very obfuscated, but the goal is that if you do this enough times with enough different numbers and enough things that cancel each other out, eventually it gets very confusing what it's actually doing. But if you turn this into an expression and then you reduce that expression with some basic math libraries, uh, you can just get A. And then the code is very visible again. <laughs> so yeah. That is an amazing technique, and it's really fun to work with. Um, and I think everyone should be introduced to that. I think everyone should work with that at some point. 
Um, let's see. Uh, but the in but doesn't the entire input uh, is what gets uh, it into one of the branches? How does that translate into modifying input but always hitting the desired branch? Um, so, it, Hoffs, what, what was that in respect to? I can't remember what I was saying at the time when you said that message. Is that related to symbolic or fuzzing um, or something from chat? I will, I will try to respond to that. Um, you remove the dead code and remove the obfuscation? Yeah. It's, it's a little bit more complex than that, right? We're simplifying a lot of this stuff. Um, but yes. Um, fuzzing initially when showing the tree thingy. So basically, how do I guarantee that I always hit that path? Um, like if I, if I have an input that hit here and I save that input off, how do I know that I hit that path again? So in that case, if I don't mutate it, and that was the caveat, if I don't mutate it, I know that. Now, obviously, if I start mutating it, I might violate this constraint, and that will cause me to not go down that path. And fuzzing, we just say we don't care. In the case of fuzzing, if that happens, we just, whatever. The fuzz case just, just doesn't do anything. And that's fuzzing. Fuzzing is typically incredibly sparse. I would say probably one in 10,000 fuzz cases and a lot of fuzzers actually do anything meaningful. That means that 99.999% of your CPU time is being thrown in the trash. Literally nothing happened. No new coverage happened, nothing interesting happened, no program crash happened, no weird loops or deadlocks happened. It literally did nothing to the program and you wasted your time. But unfortunately, finding ways to not waste your time is very difficult. So that's basically fuzzing. The, the, the state of the art in fuzzing is trying to reduce the number of fuzz cases that you perform that are worthless. Um, so what's the main benefit? Uh, having a completely re reproducible way of getting that specific branch. The main thing is... The odds are this input, let's say this input is 4,096 bytes in size. It's 4K in size. And let's say this constraint and all the constraints building up to it use maybe 1% of that input space. So the odds that you actually end up corrupting something that causes you to not go down this path are quite low. But it also puts you in a region here where you have things that are depending on other states of the input that might be more complex. And let's say this is actually a crash. Like at this location, there is a crash, and this is an exploitable bug that you can go and make your millions of dollars from when you find it, right? So effectively, what you're doing is you're hoping that A, you do not corrupt one of the bytes that allows you to get here, and B, that you corrupt a byte that allows you to get further on from that branch of where you've never seen. But yeah, that's that's effectively it. You're just you're just hoping. You're just crossing your fingers and hoping. Uh, is there a way I can reach out to you in private? I have no background in fuzzing. I have a small a strong background in math. As you explained, this might have some overlap here. Might be able to collab. Uh, you can reach out to me, um, but I'm not really looking for a collab. I'm sorry. Uh, I just, I just really like working solo. I'm sorry. I don't work well on teams, if I'm just honest. Um, so if you are interested, though, a lot of this math stuff is actually being kind of actively done. Uh, symbolic is a real thing that a lot of people are studying and, and doing work on. So there's a lot of like interesting papers out there. If you are a math person, there's a lot of like hard math stuff that you can find in this specific field. Um, I'm working on exploring some of the math behind fuzzing. I think I did a stream about it before where I, um, uh, I did a stream where I was kind of talking about some of the theoretical uh, performance properties of fuzzers. And the goal is I want to kind of, I want to kind of uh, quantify some of the properties of fuzzers, which is really difficult, but I want to kind of quantify like these probabilities here and then the probabilities relations to the complexity of the program and the 
use of that to then infer where you should maybe focus your time when you're fuzzing. Um, so like all this, all the stuff you're seeing me doing right now, like building these fuzzers, b building these VMs, these are, these are tools that allow me to extract data out that I can then analyze and then make better fuzzers from, right? This harness, the, the, what we've basically spent the past two or three weeks doing is what I consider the bare minimum for having information extracted from programs in a way that you can do meaningful things and, and build kind of uh, more complex uh, constraints and ideas of like what the actual program is doing. Because uh, the more you understand what the program is doing, the more you can understand what your input did. And the more you understand what your input did, the more you can understand how to make better inputs. Or at least, because everything's probability here, how to increase the probability of making a better input. Even if it's by 1%, I'll take it. <laughs> Do you need an assistant? I can hold stuff for you. Whew. One day, if I can ever leave my house again. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you can, uh, Quantum, you can send me a DM on, on my Twitter, which I have here. Um, uh, and what else here? I also have a Discord. Let me, let me post a link to my Discord, because I always, I always forget that I have a Discord. Here's my Discord link. <laughs> I, I always forget to post my Discord, and I never check my Discord, so... If it gets more and more popular, obviously I'll I'll probably be more responsive to things there. Um, imagine being a Twitch streamer and not having a Discord. It's so weird. Like Discord is is still new to me. It's weird because a lot of people are just like used to Discord as just the norm now, but like I'm still I'm still on that Teamspeak life. Uh, in, digital, in digital circuit verification, STM solvers are sometimes used. Uh, that is uh, sort of the same as symbolic execution, except that it is binary. Uh, fuzzing is also sort of used. They call it constraint randomized testing. Yeah, that sounds pretty neat. Where's the IRC channel? I don't think I've logged into IRC in a long time. TeamSpeak voice is definitely better. I totally agree. Oh, SMT, yeah. SMT solvers. I was like, STM solvers, that's new. Um... We're in IRC right now. Oh, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Technically. <laughs> Twitch is fancy IRC. Do we actually know if Twitch is still IRC in the back end? I feel like they might have changed the back end by now. They might have IRC wrappers, and that's still how you communicate with it. But I I'm sure their whole like, server is completely fucking custom at this point. Wouldn't be better to um, combine fuzzing with symbolic. Both seem to uh, complement each other. Fuzzing is random but fast. Symbolic can make you solve easy uh, to solve expressions that would make you lose time in the fuzzing part. That's basically what most people do to push kind of the state of the art. Um, I'm not really too convinced on symbolic yet. Uh, I don't think there are many things that symbolic can solve that fuzzing cannot get through at a comparable or faster speed. Um, of course there are some things, but they're just not realistic enough, in my opinion, to often complicate the fuzzer to make it worthwhile. But, uh, but a lot of the things that, uh, something like Symbolic can solve can be solved with a, with a fuzzer at basically the same speed. So... I would actually say typically faster because you can get through the constraints quicker. Symbolic would prove correctness. Uh, symbolic, so symbolic can find a bug and finding a bug is disproving correctness. And disproving correctness is really fucking easy for localized things. Proving correctness is basically impossible. Like, trying to actually prove something is, is, it's, it's fucking mind-boggling, right? It, it's, it's basically infeasible. 
Um, and ultimately, fuzzers are limited too. At, at the end of the day, humans are the only ones that are actually capable right now of of doing good, uh, like security audits. There, there's no automated tools out there yet that can that can audit things effectively. It's just we're not even close. We're probably not even within two decades of it. We can fuzz shit all day long, but it's it's not even close to what a human can do. Um. Let's see. Because you can have a function that can have invalid inputs, but proving that it can never be given those invalid inputs in a given program is harder. I mean, the, the, biggest, the biggest hard problem is just, like, the expressions are, are just basically infinite. Um, I mean, at a billion inputs a second with random ge genetic mutation with code coverage, uh, isn't it probable that your fuzzer is way better than the average source auditor? Um, so, typically, a fuzzer will find bugs faster than a human, but it will find fewer bugs over time, and it will find lower quality bugs, less, less sophisticated bugs, right? So, humans are going to be the ones who will find the, the best bugs, the, the super rare, super obscure, super complex, high reliability sorts of bugs. Yeah. Yep. Fuzzers basically will find... But fuzzers kind of find mistakes. And humans find... Um... Like... Just... General wrongness. Yeah. But... It, it's weird. It's weird. I think, uh... I think it's relatively difficult for, um... For really anything to, to be close to... Humans. I think that without going symbolic, there's a lot of interesting stuff to take from the program beyond just PC. Having a tool that understands deeper stuff about the program's data flow and control flow can improve the precision and thus speed of the mutation coverage feedback. Yep, that's what I currently do. So my tools uh, basically gather taint tracking and they gather diffs on all the register and memory state to determine if something happened that was different. Um, and I can use that to track uh, states and think like basically the state of network protocols, the states of files, and all these things, and they work really, really fucking well. They like I don't think I would write a fuzzer without those things now. That's kind of the the standard. Not for other people. Mo I don't think anyone has really adopted that yet. So I do that in my own tools, and then I wrote a tool internally that a, a couple other people are using in a similar way. Uh, but that sort of technique is still really rare because a lot of people just don't have a way of, of fuzzing yet. No one really has a way of harnessing things and fuzzing things yet unless it's open source and they can recompile it. It's, it's pretty fucking crazy to me. It really is. But, like, no one, no one seems to think harnessing is important. All, that, like, all the academic research is into making bit flippers that are slightly better. You're talking about 2% improvements... On something that is like fundamentally, you can get thousands of x improvements on. It, it's it's mind-boggling to me of the like race to solve a problem that doesn't even exist. And I know why they do it. It's because it's a fucking easy problem. It's because there's incremental progress the whole way. Because harnessing shit without closed source stuff, uh, or harnessing closed source stuff without kernel hypervisor level memory. Reloading your NT fork is really hard. Yeah, and that's why I'm surprised that no one's really done these things. <laughs> like, why no one's made hypervisors? Why no one's made emulation mods? Like, Unicorn exists, but no one... Like, it's so strange. It's just... It's possible. There are things like AFL Win or Win AFL that do kind of work. But they're just... Just write a driver that, like, resets page tables. When AFL sucks ass, it, it does, but it's, it, it, it's, I don't know, it, I, I, the fuzzing community is, is typically just not, not too great. It's sort of like uh, micro-optimizing an ON to the fourth. Yes, that is my viewpoint. A lot of, a lot of the fuzzing research is how to flip bits in a better way, which is typically by, done by overfitting 
to your fake problem set because you use a bunch of like CTF problems because you don't want to harness a real thing because that would take too much time. So you harness a bunch of CTF challenges and like CGC challenges, which are this, even easier than CTF challenges. And then you overfit some model and you basically find, well, if we flip the sixth bit 30% of the time at byte 30, we get slightly better results. And it's like, congrats, you overfit. <laughs> I don't know, just flip some fucking bytes, man. That's all you need to do. Flip some bytes and then write a mutator for your file format or your protocol. Don't waste your time on generic mutations. They're just ass. <laughs> They're just ass. Have you seen any of the process emulation projects that's come out in the past uh, year or so? Uh, killing? I haven't seen that. Sounds interesting. Process emulation, what does that do? Um... Emulates processes, obviously. Yeah, let me take a look. What is killing? Uh, this is gonna go to eight. All right. Oh boy. Advanced binary emulation framework. Okay, okay, okay. Let's see what th let's see what this does. Um, it's aimed to change IoT security research, all right? Combines binary instrumentation and binary emulation into a single framework. Redirect process execution flow on the fly. Okay. This, to me, just looks like a, a fancy debugger that's meant to be human usable. From with Virtual Alec 2, I've read it, but I, I forget what, what is, what's special about it. Isn't it just, got a couple more args written in Python though? I mean, all these things are, are written in Python. Performance never matters on these things. No one, no one ever cares. Right, this this would not be usable for fuzzing. You'd basically you you use this for instrumentation and tracing. When you build your tree of input mutations uh, by using the coverage info, do you ever backtrack? What do you mean by backtrack? The, I I have no state on my mutations. In in my like byte level fuzzing. I have a shit ton of state on like protocol level fuzzing, but when I'm just like flipping bytes and I'm like mutating stuff, uh, there's typically no state there at all. Yeah, I'm not building a tree of mutations, I'm uh, building a corpus of starting points. Yeah, and that's where I differ from a lot of people who do fuzzing. And I find that fucking weird. Because like AFL makes a queue of like things to do based on branches it hasn't hit. It's, it's so weird. I don't understand why it does that. It's just more work and arguably potentially worse. And I want to theorize that a bit. You have a set of mutations and ended up with some input that reaches path X, but that might lead you into another branch. Um, but that's fine because I save the, I save every input that ever generates coverage. So every path that I can ever hit, I save an input for. And if I end up changing an input and fucking it up where I can't go down that path, well, I still have the original input that I forked from. I always have the originals. I never, I never get rid of an original. If I ever hit a path that's new, that input stays, stays around literally forever. I never delete that. The data structures that I use don't even allow for deletion. I keep it around forever. Pick a random sample out of the whole corpus and go from there. Yes, exactly. So 
Skip Witch! Gifted sub to Kirby Arma! Hell yeah, thank you so much, Skip Witch! <laughs> F tier memory. RAM's cheap. RAM is cheap. Inputs are small. I don't think I've ever had more than like 100 gigs of inputs. And if that leads to better coverage, persist it and feed it back into the fuzzing loop. Yep. Absolutely. Now some interesting work can be done on how to bias that random selection. Yeah, I've got a bunch of different techniques for that, but it's also really dangerous to bias the random selection. Because if you bias it incorrectly, if you, if you end up biasing it incorrectly, which I would say a lot, a lot of existing smart fuzzers do, you end up spending 99% of your CPU time on a branch you will never get through. Because your fuzzer says, oh my god, this is a really important branch. We see like a lot of branches below it and we really want to explore this. And it's literally like, if DREF input buffer for a U128 is equal to a magic number, and the fuzzer will just sit there for eternity and make no progress. So typically what I'll do is I will bias more and more and more towards uh, certain branches, but I will reset the entire state every X amount of time. And X is usually like number of fuzz cases per input. So eventually I'll just delete all that state and that'll basically, you're doing hill climbing, right? When, once you start talking about co code coverage and feedback, we're now doing AI, right? We, we just are. Um, or like a, a, a sub-level of ML. Um, so effectively, uh, when you start biasing things, you start climbing hills and you start doing hill climbing. And that means that you start climbing to local minimums and local, max, uh, and local maximums, right? And what you want to be climbing to is global minimums and global maximums but you don't even want that in fuzzing. In fuzzing, you want to climb every single local minimum and every single local maximum because all of them have different bugs. There is no one hill that has all the bugs. All of the bugs are spread out on all different places all over. So you have to end up basically resetting your state so you can go climb a different hill. And, and that's, that's a really simple technique is you can, you can just bias branches the more you try branches, you can bias branches based on how much code is below them. You can bias branches based on, um, you can bias branches based on like how much stuff there is, like, to do under them. How much is interesting there? Um, and yeah, you just start climbing to that direction, and then just reset your biases on some interval, whatever interval your fuzzer can exhaust. Right? If your fuzzer is running a million fuzz cases a second, then you probably reset your biases every second. If you're running 10 fuzz cases a second, reset your biases every hour. Like pick some number that you use to just reset all your biases so you can try and climb a new hill. That's the beauty of fuzzing. And that's what a lot of people don't, don't get. So one technique that can be used to make sure that you never end up climbing the wrong hill, and I have found to be universally amazing, is always have a 50% chance of not doing the smart thing. So you have this crazy database that tells you all these biases, all these things. So let's say you have these in, this input database with all these different biases of which one you wanna pick. Have a 50% chance of uniformly picking an input, and then the other 50% chance, you do your smart logic, find, parse, pick the one with the highest bias, with the correct weight, with the relation to the coverage you just got, but 50% of the time, just do uniform. And that means worst case scenario, worst case scenario, if you end up climbing a hill that dead ends you for eternity, you will only lose half of your fuzzer's performance. You're guaranteed at least half your fuzzer's performance at all times, because half the time you're just doing pure random. And that means if you're getting a, a 50x improvement from the biasing, which is very possible to get a 50x improvement on your coverage, not on the amount of coverage you have, but the speed of which you achieve the coverage, right? When I'm talking about improving a fuzzer, I'm never talking about getting more coverage. I'm talking about getting the exact same coverage X amount of time faster. And typically an order of magnitude is like the noise floor. So until I see a 10x improvement, so Let's say it takes me, when I first wrote my dumb fuzzer, whatever my dumb fuzzer is, let's say it took two hours 
to get to, uh, let's say it took two hours to get to 5,000 blocks of coverage. And then I've changed my fuzzer. And unless that change made me get to that 5,000 or whatever number I said of coverage in 12 minutes, I don't consider it significant enough to say that what I did actually made it better. And it's just, it's typically not worth it. There are just so many things that are 10Xs that there's no reason to chase 5% improvements in fuzzing. It's just a waste of time. So, and typically my rule is my fuzzer can find all the bugs that I ever find. Uh, so when I'm writing a fuzzer against a target, I typically re-architect and redesign my fuzzer in a way that um, I find every single coverage, everything, every single piece of coverage I've ever observed and every single crash I've ever observed in let's say under an hour. I typically strive for like five minutes. So that means I have some target that I've been working on for months and finding bugs and tweaking my fuzzer and making it better and doing all these things. But I wanna be able to find all the bugs that I've ever found and all the coverage I've ever found in about five minutes. But yeah, that's, uh, I think that's fuzzing in a, nu in a nutshell. Um, let's get this commit in. Uh, get status, get commits, uh, get add kernel source, get add shared AHT, get status, get commit AM, um, uh, snapshotted app framework in place. Get push. Can this be its own YouTube vid? Um, like this VOD or this like past 20 minutes of ranting or probably hour of ranting. Who knows what it's been now. Um, past fuzzing ranting? Yeah, I can try that. Could clip it. There's limits on clips, I think. Maybe you can do long clips now. I'm not sure if that's a thing. Um, how do you survive to code that long every day? It's not that difficult. The, they're, they're my own problems, so I'm happy about them. I will upload the whole thing. That will definitely be, that will definitely happen. Actually, today's VOD will go up sooner than yesterday's because yesterday's VOD uh, got cut off because of my computer blue, uh, uh, kernel panicked. So I have to like splice the videos together, which means I'll be lazy and I won't do that for a while. <laughs> but we will need to find a different target to fuzz potentially. Um, but I'm probably gonna start using this tool. So I'm probably gonna start using this. I've got a target I need to start using this on. So I'll probably make a bunch of changes to this to make it better. But hell yeah. I think I will wrap up this stream here. It has been a good stream. We got a lot of stuff done. Kind of polished everything up. I, I, I completely forgot we even wrote the whole, um, I guess we should m merge this in. Let's go, um, let's get this merged in uh, Sausage Factory. Arm shell code. Yeah, we'll just copy that in as is. Um, Okay, we'll copy in from uh, Sausage Factory to here. Sauc remove the Sausage Factory test snap. Get status. Get add Sausage Factory. Get commit am included Sausage Factory for snapshotting win 64 targets. Get push. It says splice and just put an end card after the first video and insert video too. <laughs> Hell yeah. So I hope we all had fun. Got to raid someone. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and let's see. Let's see what I can find here. Let's see if there's anyone here that I know. Um, and then I'm just going to, I'm going to fall asleep real good here. Um, we're going to raid last miles. I like Last Mouse quite a bit. I love what he does. 
So, we'll send you over. Thanks for the stream. Hell yeah, no problem. Anytime. Thank you so much. We'll, uh, we'll send a raid over to Last Miles. See you guys over there.